bit closer. Oh, Tina Sillett is waiting. Gosh. Um, yes, we need to be further back, don't we? Has he seen our famous backdrop? I don't know. Yeah, it's probably because he was at a club network a few years, isn't he? Hmm. And then after this is over, it's 12.30 to 1.30, is it? Yeah. If we could spend just five minutes before the two o'clock looking at the conference care. Yeah. Thing. Heather Cooper always sounds like a sort of agony aunt or someone on the BBC. Or <laughs> who do, well, who did the... Food program, wasn't that Heather Cooper? Uh, not the names I recognise. Uh, I can't, Charles, I can't see who they are. Yes, do we normally see that panel on the right? Yeah. We do, okay. Oh, Greg's there, okay. Oh, good, excellent. We didn't test our audios and things, but I expect they were. Hi, Greg. He's muted. Mm. Oh, uh, hi. There we go. Hi. <laughs> hi, great. Hi, Greg. How are you doing? Nice to see you. Yeah, good to see you. you. You met Michael last time, didn't you? Yeah, Michael, how are you doing? Good, thank you. I'm trying to cover up. I fell off my bike, so I've got scabs on me. So, oh gosh, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to cover those up horrible, with the microphone. Horrible disease. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It looks okay. It looks as if you've got um, some device attached to the microphone. It sort of doesn't yeah, look too okay. bad. Well, I, might, I might just like go with that. I think that's the best I can do. <laughs> yeah. Use. Anyway, all right. So we're good to go. I've got the presentation set up in the background. Great. Yes, people are waiting. Um, we've got ten people waiting. So um, done wonderfully well to get a big turnout. That's incredible. Well, yes, over 80 have registered. We'll see how, you know, they're probably working. So it depends, you know, whether they can get away or not. But I think we had a good crowd today. Yeah. So 15 now. 15 yeah. waiting. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just, I thought it might be interesting to know, we'd, we're doing a survey of our members and asking them, the survey's not closed yet, but uh, we're asking them what the company plans are. Um, and at the moment, so, so far, 21% have said that their office is planning to reopen next month. 18% um, in the next two to three months. And then 44% say the company hasn't decided when to reopen. Wow. So, but, so they yeah, might that's, that's huge, isn't it? Yeah, mm. yeah. So um, it, that, I thought that was quite interesting. And um, people are not really ready to kind of go out and do networking and things yet. So there's still a lot of a lot of caution out there. I think. Yeah, fair enough. Scary yeah. times. Scary times, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to let people in. Um, I'll wait for a few more to um to join and then i'll introduce you
Yeah, feel free to turn my video and audio off um, until you're ready for me to go. Okay. I mean, people should be looking at you, right? Okay. Um... So we've got... 31. Whoa. Are we recording this? Oh, no. Yes. Are we? Yeah. Are you recording? Good. Excellent. Excellent. Good. Shh. Wow, great. 36 people have come in. That's fantastic. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Charmian. Um, this is Michael, my husband. We're the uh, directors of the PA Club. Uh, this is a fantastic turnout today, and it's obviously a topic um, returning to a safe workplace that resonates with, with you all. Um, we know that for a lot of you, you're not sure yet when, when you're going to be heading back to the office and, and how much, how full time you're going to be at the office. But, um, but this presentation will be really helpful in giving you some, some guidelines for, um, for coming back. Sorry, there are people coming in all the time. I have to keep, I have to keep opening the door for them. Um, some guidelines about, about returning to a safe workspace. It's a, it's a very, very good, very clear um, and very helpful uh, presentation. And Greg will um, answer questions at the end. So if questions occur to you during the course of the, um, of the presentation, please just put them into the chat and I will forward them to Greg. Let me just um, reveal Greg to you, who's hiding um, in the background. And uh, there he is. <laughs> um, and I think over to you, Greg. Much, Charmian. Thank you very much, Charmian. Look, it's wonderful um, to be engaging with everyone on this really important subject. There's a lot of uncertainty as to what's going to happen going forwards. There are very, very large numbers of companies who just haven't really got to grips with what to do. Um, and whilst the furlough remains, um, most companies are just electing to um, take a softly approach, which is let's keep everyone safe, stay at home, work at home as much as we can. Um, and, and that's also reinforced by the fact that many customers aren't back either. So there's no point in having your business all back if your customers aren't back either. So we expect that there's going to be a sort of when the furlough ends and the government's a bit happier about um, releasing um, social distancing to some extent, um, then you would expect a, a flood of people to go back to work. For the moment, though, what the government has done is a couple of weeks ago, it's released um, a whole bunch of guidelines. In fact, I think it's a 55 page document for what to do in offices. So um, we are a office furniture design and uh, manufacturing company as well. And so Jamie and I started a conversation a couple of weeks ago about what, what does it mean for um, PAs and, and EAs and office managers who are in a situation where um, no one really knows what to do. And yet, everyone on this call will probably be turned to by the managing partner and say, hey, it's, it, can you help me with this? So what, what together we've put together, um, Charmian and myself, put together a bit of an overview as to sort of what's, what's the, what the government is saying and then how you can go about executing that in a way that hopefully makes it really simple. Because even if you're not responsible for rolling it out, you will be looked at as someone who should know about what's going on. And so we're giving you some really a simple framework to think about that. Um, and to talk to customer, to talk to your um, your managing partners uh, and 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 directors about. So if I might just skip, uh, might try and share my screen now. So let's, sorry, get the screen back up. Uh, that's not working very well. There we go. That's oops. I've completely hidden the screen now. So uh, let me push on that one. There we go. There we go, back up. So let me open up the share screen. There we go, and open up the presentation and put it on full view. Okay, does that look okay for everyone? Uh, Charmian, can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so returning to the office post lockdown. So the starting point for this discussion is what the government has said. Now, there's been a lot of controversy in the media saying um, the government hasn't provided strong enough guidelines as to what companies should do. And that's actually intentional because what the government has said is actually this is a health and safety matter. 
Uh, and therefore, every company needs to do a risk assessment related to COVID-19 specifically. And what, what those companies must do is do it as soon as possible and in consultation with the HSE representative of the office and with staff. And so if you like, what the government's done is said, look, this is a legal matter. It's a legal obligation around health and safety. The health and safety executive are responsible for policing that. And therefore it's up to every individual company to assess the risks in relation to COVID-19 in their workplace and do something about it. So that's why there's not a whole lot of clear cut guidance necessarily from the government, because they're saying it's actually a health and safety issue. Every office is different, every workforce is different. So you need to come up with your own solutions. And that's why there's a bit of confusion. So you need to know that number one. The second thing they've done is so whilst the sticks um, in terms of legal compliance are the legal obligation on, as policed by the health and safety executive, on the other hand, they've also created a bit of a carrot. Uh, in the form of this crazy little blue sign here, which basically says we as an office have have conducted a risk assessment and in accordance with the government guidelines, and therefore our workplace is safe. And what the government's encouraging uh, employers to do is to print this out, have it signed by the health and safety uh, exec, uh, representative and by the, the managing partner and print it out and put it on the wall. And what we're seeing is this now being used. You'll see this increasingly in the front windows of offices and even shops maybe. Um, increasingly used as a sort of badge of safety to say, look, we've got a safe bubble here. Um, we're doing the government's guidelines um, and therefore this should be a safe space or safer space um, for you to come into as an employee. And let's remember this carrot's really important because we know that whilst um, uh, the bosses want everyone to come back to work because then they get um, uh, good productivity and, and the business going again, there are a lot of individuals who are very nervous about going back to work. So that's where this carrot, carrot comes into play. You can say, hey, look, we're doing our best here. We're following the guidelines um, and, and we've done some good risk assessment work around it. So that, that's the sort of legal context for the thinking around um, how you go about um, coming up with a, with a solution to, to make your uh, office safe. But it's not particularly detailed. So what we've done is we've been through all of the government's guidance. We've also looked at best practice around the world and we're working with employers, including BP, um, including British Land, all these other guys. And we've said, well, what, what are we doing on our projects all around the UK and what's going on overseas? Uh, and so we've come up with a really sort of simple framework because when you start your risk assessment, whether it's you or someone else, you need some sort of framework to get started with. Uh, and the framework that we've come up is a simple four H's, right? Hygiene, hours, horizontal distance, and home working. So um, I, Charmin will make this available so you'll have the full copy of this. And there's some resources at the back where you can get more details on these. But what um, Charmin's encouraged me to do is sort of go through these one by one, provide a little bit of context so you can get a feel for each of these H's. Um, and then we'll talk at the end about um, the three C's for the sort of context around that as well. But so if you're structuring, a risk assessment, starting with the four H's as your topic headings is a good way to do it. Um, and by the way, um, what we've done and, and, and our clients are doing is doing that risk assessment, not with your normal HSE assessment and putting a couple of lines underneath that, because that then means that as an ongoing basis, you'll have to come back and revisit those. What most of our clients and ourselves have done is have started a whole new version of that. So taking that health and safety risk assessment and basically blanking it all out and starting again to say, um, this is the COVID-19 risk assessment, because let's recognise if everything goes well in six months time, this won't be need needed anymore. So let's dive in. Uh, number one, hygiene. Um, the good thing is there's a whole bunch of really obvious stuff that should be done in every office. Um, so that is hand wash, sanitizers, tissues in order to catch a, capture sneezes, face masks. Um, when we started this conversation around what we do in offices. Face masks were a big question mark. The government wasn't sure about them. Well, I think generally everyone's accepting that face masks are a good thing. So therefore you need to have them in the office, ideally at the front uh, front desk, um, so that people put them on when they come in if they've forgotten their own. Signage, um, there's a lot of really nice signs on how to use, how to wash your hands properly and all those sorts of things. So they're appearing in offices. Um, more frequent and thorough cleaning, because if you've got um, a desk being shared by someone and Naomi, Naomi has asked some wonderful questions um, that I'll answer at the end about um, sharing desks. Um, you, it, it, the desks need to be cleaned every time a user um, moves out of it before someone else comes in, but more, more thoroughly um, daily cleaning is, appears to be um, emerging as the, the norm in terms of approaching a whole, a whole office cleaning. 
And then, of course, regular emptying of bins, because if you've got materials such as masks and gloves and, and tissues that have been sneezed in, obviously you want to get rid of those um, on a very regular basis um, in order to get those virus um, germs out of your office. So that's the obvious stuff. There's also a bunch of not so obvious stuff. So for instance, increasing air exchange and opening windows because the government's found that there's a lot of sort of fresh air benefits um, and COVID-19 seems to be um, not so prevalent in outdoor uh, and, and better ventilated areas. So opening up the air exchange. Um, and that's as simple as talking to your um, building services guys to say, can we increase the number of air exchanges through our air conditioning system? And they just basically twist a dial um, and opening windows with the lovely climate we've got right now. Why wouldn't we do that? Secondly, then, uh, checking staff temperatures as they arrive at work. Now, we've all seen photos and, and videos of in Hun, uh, province, Wuhan province, sorry, people having their temperatures checked as they go by their day, about their day-to-day -day activities. Well, actually, what we're finding is many employers are buying uh, infrared uh, thermometers, pointing at people's foreheads as they come in. And that's a pretty easy uh, and sensible approach, because if you record people's temperatures um, and they, they're above a reasonable limit, limit, then sending them home at the door is so much better than waiting till they get into the office, start to sneeze a bit, start to feel a bit unwell, um, and then they go home having contaminated your safe bubble that you've created in your office. Um, and recording those also helps to track what's going on, right? So if you know that Daryl came in um, and, and at the reception desk had a high temperature, goes home again, then you can think, okay, where did Daryl sit yesterday? Who was around then? And you can track what's going on in your staff a little bit uh, better. Um, and then finally, the, the, the other part of that staff temperature checking is having some really clear protocols for someone who might have a high temperature. Um, what, what you don't want to do is um, have someone come in and you go, okay, well, I don't know what to do. Why don't you come in and sit down over there and I'll figure out what to do. What you need is your managing partners and managing directors to have said, right, it's really clear, this is the policy. If someone has a temperature above X, they go straight away home, or if someone's feeling unwell in the office, straight away they go home and then they self out. Isolate. And this is what we expect the behavior to be in those circumstances. And what that does is it means that whoever's administering the temperature tests, then they're not in this really awkward situation of having to tell someone very senior to go home um, when the senior person says, well, I'm not going to do that because you're very junior, I'm very senior, I'm going to keep working. But actually having those protocols signed off at the highest level um, in order to um, make sure that the right thing happens there just makes everyone's life a lot easier. You say, hey, if you're, you happen to be the unfortunate one doing the testing, you can say, well, look, here's the process. This has all been signed off. I'm sorry, can't let you in the office. Please go home. Um, we look forward to you working from home. That sort of stuff. So that's sort of broadly a bit of an overview of some of the hygiene stuff that needs to be covered off uh, in your risk assessment. And obviously, you can start planning for most of that very simply. It's not very difficult. It's pretty obvious. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk in the media about it. So number two, the second age, after hygiene come hours. Uh, we're seeing some really interesting things happening around st staggering start times and break times, because as you can imagine, if you have a strict start time where everyone starts at the same period, um, getting into the building through lifts, through turnstiles, through doors, um, through the car park is all fairly congested. Um, and that's not ideal. And then everyone wants to go to the coffee machine at the same time and have their lunch at the same time. And all of that is artificially creating um, congestion, which you can simply solve by saying, okay, this team will start at this time. This team will start 15 minutes later, this team 15 minutes earlier, and off we go like that. Of course, the extreme version of that is shifts. And we're seeing some companies saying, look, we're gonna have two shifts through the day. Um, in order that we keep everyone separated and reduce the load on our lifts and on our coffee machines and all those sorts of things. Um, and the final note is that it, this is not just about congestion in the office, it's also about congestion on public transport. So peak times on roads, that's inefficient for everyone uh, and creates problems and public transport. There's been a lot of, um, initially early on as the lockdown was started to be eased, a lot of concern about public transport. And, and this will be one of the, the main points that staff will be raising when they express concern about coming into the office, which is, hey, I've got to catch public transport because I work in the centre of London or Manchester or whatever. Um, that means then that there's a real point for pushback. So saying to them, hey, look, we're doing our best to manage that. Um, here's a staggered out solution. That means that you can come in early um, in order to do that and you'll be welcome to do that. So coming up, this is about sort of solution um, management as well. So ha having these sorts of um, hour related or start time related solutions is very helpful as well.
So we've dealt with hygiene, we've dealt with hours. What about horizontal separation, which uh, in inverted commas is sort of, well, two metres for now. And the government's talking about one metre, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of debate about that in the medical community. So two metres seems to be the prevailing view because a sneeze doesn't travel more than about two metres. Very simple. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of stuff around horizontal separation. And, and so starts with only having a small percentage of staff back in the office. Um, best practice seems to now be somewhere around 40 to 50% um, with the right uh, set up in the office with line markings and whatnot. People are saying, well, look, pretty much every second desk can be used. And if it's a bank of six, two at the ends on one side and one in the middle on the other side, that can work um, with a two meter separation. But it means that really you're using every second desk. Um, some employers have the luxury of uh, freestanding desks, so they're able to turn those to face walls um, and put desks into meeting rooms because right now no, no one will be inviting visitors into the office. Uh, that would be crazy. So actually using those meeting rooms as small offices means that you can isolate people uh, a little bit better there. And then simple stuff like, well, how do people eat? Well, spacing out tables in canteens and kitchens and removing chairs in between is really smart. Uh, because that means you're in encouraging separation. Um, similarly, staff eating at desks. So for decades, people have said, don't eat at your desk. Well, now maybe it's a good time to eat at your desk, right? So rebel against the system uh, and encourage people to eat at their desks because that means they're keeping away from everyone else. Um, there's been some interesting, and I've got some photos for you in a second, sort of interesting um, thinking around establishing one-way routes, um, for example, with floor arrows um, and the use of visual separation cues and queuing systems in, in congested areas. Let's call them danger zones. So in front of lifts, uh, in front of toilets, all those areas. And I'll show you some ideas for that at the moment. Uh, encouraging the use of stairs and reducing the maximum number of people using lifts and those sorts of things. So here's a couple of interesting photos. What's been going on? You don't have to make your office ugly in order to put lines and markings. So this is a, a beautiful carpet tile solution. Um, and, and there are manufacturers out there who've designed these. I particularly like this because what that means is if you've got a flooring system right now that looks beautiful, you can just pick up the odd carpet tile, replace it with something with an arrow in it, um, and then at the end of COVID-19, simply put those old tiles back. They're all 500 by 500, nice and modular. Very easy to put those tiles aside. Um, and at the end of this pandemic, go and just drop those back in and you can keep the arrow tiles um, for other potential emergencies uh, in the future. So a really elegant solution. Here's another example um, using sort of uh, diagonally cut carpet tiles to create arrows on floors and other zones. So you can see around the table and chairs there, how there's a zone there. Um, and obviously establishing a language around that to say, okay, dark areas means we need to, it's where people congregate. Um, I would add that they should probably remove every second chair in that, um, in that layout there, but just reminding people that this is where they con congregate um, and think about how they use um, that space a bit more sensibly to keep the two meter social distancing there. Um, and then finally, for those danger zones that I talked about, sort of what do you do in a lift area? Well, there's some interesting patterns that you can put on the floor. It's all about visual cues, really. And I had to laugh. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of a cyclist myself. Um, and going around Regent's Park, there's actually a series of lines where bikes stop um, in order to queue bikes um, at the traffic lights uh, in Regent's Park. So actually, people are now responding to those sorts of cues um, and, and changing their behavior accordingly, which is good to see. So these sorts of things really do work um, and they remind people of what's going on. There's some horrendous, um, if you want a really good laugh, I'll show you a link at the end. Um, if you want to see how to make a lift look ugly, there's all sorts of government guidelines for how to subdivide lifts with um, stripy tape on the floor. Uh, and putting, putting footprints so people face into the walls um, is, is hilarious, but on the other hand, incredibly sensible. Okay, so there's some examples of, um, um, what do we talk with? H hygiene, um, hours, um, uh, horizontal separation, and now we're on to home working. So there's some interesting statistics came out. There was a, a survey called the Global Work From Home Experience Survey by Ionometrics um, of 3,000 people, which is quite a decent sample size uh, over the last month or so. And what they found is that 77% of workers say they want to continue to work from home at least weekly when the pandemic's over, and 60% of workers would be prepared to give up an assigned desk, i.e. work in a hot desking sort of arrangement in order to do that. So the logical conclusion here is the world's changing, right? And, and one way to look at it, that is that we had the technology to work from home, but there was various trust issues with that. Staff were worried that if they didn't go into work, they'd be seen to be slacking off. Um, bosses were worried that if people worked from home, they wouldn't get any work done and they'd goof off and, and play Nintendo all day. Well, actually, 
the world has proven that remote working works um, and that Zoom and Teams and all those wonderful tools are actually making work very productive at home. So actually there is a shift happening and people are saying, you know, I used to commute two hours every day into central London or central Birmingham. That just doesn't seem like a good use of my time anymore. I'm loving time with the family. I'm able to cook. I'm able to help kids with their homework. I just don't want to do that anymore. Is there a way that I can work from home? Let's explore that with the next part, the, the future of the company. And that's right from bosses right down to everyone in the organization. So there will be a really interesting conversation coming up about what the future of the office looks like. It's probably going to have fewer desks, a bit more sharing. But on the other hand, that extra space is probably going to be used for more lounges uh, and breakout spaces and, and collaborative working spaces with fewer walls because that just traps people into a room. I think people are now appreciating sort of fresh air and open spaces a whole lot more. So why not bring those into offices? And we're entering a whole design conversation here. Apologies for that. I can't help myself. It's what we do. But uh, if that's of interest to you, love to continue that conversation. So what do you do about home working? Well, topic number four, well, the best, first of all, let's recognize it's the best way to shield staff. If someone is actually in a vulnerable situation, having them work from home is the easy solution. Uh, and that means that you've actually got more room in the office because you've got fewer staff in there. Um, let's also recognize that uh, working from home is a really important uh, ergonomic experience. People, if people are gonna work long hours, they have to have as an absolute minimum, an ergonomically adjustable chair, um, just as you would in an office, um, and a screen height just below eye level. Otherwise, you're leading to, as, you, as we all know, some of us have sat for decades at home on, on kitchen chairs um, and got a sore back. It just starts to hurt, and without the right elbow support, the right height, you start to get a sore neck, leading to all sorts of um, problems, including the fact that, frankly, after six or seven hours sitting there, you just go, I'm feeling too too sore from this, I'm going to have to stop working. And that's a productivity dive um, for the company. And also, if you want to get ahead in your career and if you enjoy your work, that's actually taking you away from what you enjoy. And so what we're finding is that many companies are paying for staff to have home office furniture because, first of all, it's an HSE obligation. If you read the rules, which I'm sure some of you will have, um, the, the health and safety executive says, um, if someone's working home on a a long-term basis, then they have to have um, pro appropriate um, HSE assessment and, and furniture for that. Uh, we've mentioned the productivity point. Um, and then thirdly, a point that no one's really picked up in the media that we've seen is that if there is another lockdown coming, having staff in comfortable furniture so they can work home at home well and productively is a bit of a no-brainer because when the lockdown happens next time, if it happens, let's hope it doesn't, but if it does, it's going to be too late to get proper furniture into people's homes. Um, so actually taking the time to do that right now. In a world where more people will be working from home, that seems like a pretty good investment. Um, and there are various organisations, I think it's Twitter and, and organisations like that, that have said, well, we're going, to, we're going to encourage people to work from home and we might even shut down a lot of offices. So the world is changing uh, and home office furniture is increasingly important. So there we are. We've dealt with um, the four different H's um, of things that you should really be thinking about on that risk assessment for your office. But let's not forget three other things as well. So firstly, comfort. At the end of the day, we want people to be comfortable um, wherever they're working. Um, and that relates to making sure that people feel as though they're safe at work. But it also makes sure that if someone's working from home, they've got the ergonomic support they need to be productive. Um, secondly, let's not forget about climate change. Now, you will recall that not three or four months ago, the world was very concerned with Extinction Revolution um, uh, protests with Greta Thunberg um, doing her thing uh, around climate change. And so are we. I mean, we're a sustainable furniture company. Um, that was the number one focus until the pandemic broke out. What we don't want to do is go backwards um, and, and actually initiate some processes that lead to a worse climate change. This is the decade for action in inverted commas. So, and there are a lot of organizations taking that very seriously, which is great news. So if you're a champion for climate change, here's your chance to make sure that things don't go back to the way they were. Um, and, and what's more, we shouldn't. And, the, and you would have seen in the media a lot of sort of green, uh, green uh, recovery discussions about how uh, the, uh, the British public um, when surveyed recently said that this is actually very important to them and that a green recovery is the most important thing that the government should be thinking about. And the final point, of course, is cost, is that yeah, wouldn't it be great to put screens everywhere, brand new furniture, everyone gets new stuff at home, but practically this is a pretty lean time in any organization's finances. So thinking pretty hard about cost 
um, is really important. So, so what I've done now um, at Charmian's um, suggestion was come up with a solution around that and, and it happens to be what we, we, we focus our business on, which is how do you get comfortable furniture that doesn't hurt the climate that actually reduces cost as well? Um, and so a little bit of a, um, a sort of advert for a, a new world of furniture that's occurring. Um, and, and the reason furniture is important, by the way. Hello? Sorry. Just heard someone there. No, okay. And the reason furniture is important is because if you, if you care about the environment, and, and a lot of people do these days, um, then you want to know where greenhouse gases, gases are occurring within a building. And what we thought was fascinating um, and very educational is where in a building greenhouse gas emissions occur over the entire lifetime of a building. So for instance, operational energy, that's the lights, the air conditioning systems, all that sort of stuff, the, the energy that's pumped into a building, that's only 24%, which frankly surprised me. Coffee cups, which there's a lot of attention being paid to that regarding the environment, well, they, they fall within that other 6%, so it's not really material. Um, a lot of people think it's all about the building structure. Actually, that's only about 19%. Services, quite small, but actually furnishings are an enormous proportion of the greenhouse gas emissions over the entire life of buildings. And the reason for that, according to this, this fantastic paper that we're citing here, where this graph came from, is that furniture is, tends to be thrown out every six or so years when a, when a company moves or when there's a refit or refurbishment of their offices. And that's a massive waste. And what we discovered is that actually remanufacturing that furniture, and I'll explain what that means in a minute, can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by 80%. So there's a chance to right there, reduce your entire building's greenhouse gas emissions by 24%, which is 80% of 30%, 30% um, which is almost a quarter of the entire lifetime greenhouse gas emissions. And the way that we do that is we are a remanufactured furniture um, company and we also do some sustainable new stuff as well. Think about the circular economy taking quality pieces from a whole bunch of sources, including existing furniture, um, taking those back to their raw components, checking them um, and then resurfacing them and putting them back together with reconditioned parts so that you've got something that looks and performs as good as new. Doing that creates UK jobs. It's all quality controlled engineering processes. Um, we're a bunch of engineers. I'm an engineer. Sorry about that. Um, and then install those on site. And of course, what makes it circular is that we do that over and over again. So we have a guaranteed take back for, um, uh, contract and clause that says we'll take that furniture back every time you don't want it. And so what that means is that you've actually not only reduced your greenhouse gas emissions, but re remanufactured furniture is much, much cheaper. Um, than buying furniture that's come from virgin resources. Um, you'll note the language there, we don't use the term new anymore. We talk about furniture from virgin resources because let's call a spade a spade. Um, and that means that not only have you got an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, but you've also reduced your costs by quite a lot really. Uh, and this is an example for a desk chair on the screen. Uh, enough of that, let's, um, let's get in some questions in a minute. So in summary, what we've got is the four H's to think about. So sorry, before that, in summary, health and safety um, risk assessment is the number one thing to get started on. Um, four topics to include within that are hygiene, hours, horizontal distance and home working. But let's not forget comfort, climate change and cost. So the four H's and the four C's, let's keep that simple. Um, and obviously this presentation will be made available by Charmian for you to refer to uh, on this subject. Um, some useful resources we've included here. Um, we actually have a free design service. If you have an office for over 20 staff, we employ uh, architects and interior designers in order to help organizations rethink their furniture. And we ask to be able in return for that to be able to quote for that furniture um, with our remanufactured furniture. Um, so that's a free service. If you'd like to do that, please give me a, uh, drop me an email or give me a call. Love to speak to you about it. Um, what we find is that people are very passionate about saving money, um, especially these days, um, and saving the environment. So any, any good ideas, they're open to, and we have a whole bunch of sustainability solutions, including how to prepare your office. We've also written a blog. So that's a, there's a blog net um, there on how to prepare your office after lockdown, which goes into a little more detail about what I've spoken about in terms of the four H's. Um, and that's all based on government guidance um, and, and also draws in some of the best practices we've seen around the world. We've also written a blog on the five tips for home office productivity, which really focuses on, well, if you're working from home or you have staff working from home, what are the inexpensive cost-effective things you can do to make their life com comfortable? So simple things like roll up a tower, towel and use it as lumbar support in a kitchen chair if you can't get anything better than that. 
And then finally, there's a link here to the UK government guidelines uh, where you'll find the full um, document produced by the government on, on what to do about officers, worth a read or at least the first introduction to that to see how the government's thinking about that. I've summarised it around the health and safety side of things, uh, but obviously you might want to refer back to that. Um, and through that site, you can also get a hold of um, that little um, white and uh, blue symbol um, that you might like to print out. So that's pretty much it. So I'd love to open up with some questions. Now, now, Charmian, would you like to come back online and, and oversee that for us? Um, I, I do have three wonderful questions from Naomi. So if you'd like, I could start on those. Or did you have some other questions um, that you'd like to cover first? Sorry, I'm not hearing you, Charmian. Have you got your uh, mute on? Is that better? That's yeah, hearing you now. Okay, great. Um, I don't know why it does that. Okay, so wh why don't you start with those questions that Naomi sent in uh, in advance, and then I've got a couple more here. Okay, thank you. If you could moderate that, that'd be great. So uh, for Naomi's first question was, what about access accessibility? And she told the tale um, in her email about how their, their offices or their office building has had the whole lift system shut down and no one's allowed to use the lift. Um, and, and her question was a, a very sensible one. What if someone has a disability and genuinely can't get up two floors um, to her offices? The response to that is it's very, very unusual for building managers to be that belligerent, um, especially when um, they, they may know that there are disabled users in the building. So uh, the recommendation would be to go and have a chat with the building managers. Um, if someone has shut down the lift, probably the landlord doesn't really know about that or, or, or they're being naughty basically because that shouldn't be done. Um, lifts should be available for those who are um, unable to use stairs. Of course, encouraging people to use stairs is important and maybe something as simple as a sign on the lift that says, look, this lift is um, limited occupancy and we're keeping it as a priority uh, for disabled people. Could you please use the stairs um, if you're able? So something like that and a bit of a reasonable conversation feels like the right approach. I think legally there's real issues about shutting off uh, disabled access. Uh, second, second question was a really good one, which basically said, look, apart from all this setup, um, which obviously we've I've talked about, what are the day-to-day -day things that an office manager or, or PA should be worried about in terms of just keeping the office going um, in, in a COVID-19 uh, pandemic environment? And, and I, having thought about that, I think there's really three things that really need to be managed closely on a day-to-day -day basis. One is cleaning. So we've talked about the importance of um, cleaning on a very regular basis to wipe up any uh, viral germs that are around. Um, and that, and that's, that can't be emphasized enough and needs to be managed, right? Because um, cutting corners on cleaning is an easy way to save money, but on the other hand, it's not doing any favors for your staff. And pretty soon, if someone's coming in on the second or third day without proper cleaning having occurred, you might have a little bit of a staff revolution on your hands. Um, and people just say, well, why should I come into work when appropriate cleaning is not being done? And what that's doing is eroding confidence in that sort of safe bubble that you've been creating um, through the, uh, the health and safety assessment. The second day-to-day -day thing is about uh, replenishing supplies. Now, I don't know if uh, you've seen it. I, I've had to make some uh, dashes here and there uh, for various reasons, um, including that I fell off my bike recently, so I was in hospital. And nothing drives you more crazy than going to hand sanitizer, pushing it, nothing comes out. That's something that will draw complaints very regularly. So keeping those supplies up to date, including masks, hand sanitizers, soaps for bathrooms, tissues, those sorts of basics. The good thing is they don't cost very much, but staying on top of that, ordering a big order from your Tesco regular delivery uh, and getting them installed in, in a cupboard somewhere um, is just very sensible because that'll bring a lot of um, complaints from staff, especially if you're encouraging them to use them. Um, and the third one, um, which is really important on a day-to-day -day basis, is just reinforcing good behaviour and encouraging people to do the right thing. So um, if you've got someone who's particularly visible at using a hand sanitizer, actually publicly thanking them for doing that, um, or if you've got other behaviours that are good, of course you want to reward those to encourage stuff, good staff behaviour, but also picking up on bad behaviour. And given the, um, the influence of this group on the senior directors within organisations, 
impressing on them the importance of leading by example and publicly sanitizing their hands when they come in, being happy to have their temperature taken. I mean, for instance, if you work in a law office, many law partners are famous for their uh, temper uh, and egos. So they might say, oh, I don't need to do it. I'm well, actually that's setting a really big exa bad example for staff. So um, ensuring that those senior leaders in the firm rec uh, recognize that they are the peer leaders in this and that they have to do something about this. And frankly, as directors, they have a legal responsibility for health and safety. So this actually in their own interest anyway, otherwise there's all sorts of issues if people die and, and there's an investigation done. So actually making them the leaders. So those are the three things I think day to day, get making sure the regular cleaning occurs, replenishing supplies and reinforcing and, and exhibiting good behavior. Um, and anyone who's behaving badly, making sure they're appropriately reprimanded. In, in relation to that, Greg, and the question has just come in from Isabel, um, if PPE is not required uh, for an individual to do their job, is it the responsibility of the employer to provide it? You, you were talking about um, masks and, and hand sanitizers and things. Is it, is it the, the employer's responsibility? Yeah, and, and this is a pretty grey area. I mean, at the end of the day, the government is saying masks, well, we weren't so sure, but now we're a little bit sure. Uh, and if the, the issue is, if someone died, uh, would the company be responsible? Well, it's very hard to figure that out. What we're seeing, though, is that the issue is not what's going to happen if someone died. The issue is staff going, look, I'm not happy about going into a workplace. Why should I come back to work? If all the right measures haven't been in place. And if that's as simple as putting a box of masks at the front desk, that's a very inexpensive thing to do. And what a box of masks does, it says, like, even if you bring your own, that's great, you can wear it. Even if you don't, there's something there for you. And what it's doing is demonstrating the commitment of the company to looking after the safety of people. So it's creating that bubble. So legally, are they obliged to? Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, ethically, are they obliged to? Absolutely. Is it gonna cost a lot to do? not very much and is it going to show up on your risk assessment absolutely right so come back to that legal document which is your risk assessment have you done the bare basics well you probably masks are going to be a no-brainer in that right it's a way to reduce the risk of people spreading virus of course it should be on the risk assessment so it, you don't really have to about the, worry about the legality if it's gone into the risk assessment it will be an action item and then it can be done and it's not going to cost a lot of money is, is my key point um, Shall I get on to the third question from Naomi? Or did you have any follow-ups on uh, that? No, sure. Sure do, Greg. Okay, so, so Naomi's third question was a good one around sharing desks because some of us work in offices where desks are shared. Um, there might be two people shifting or, or um, uh, part-time working um, and, or job sharing. First of all, on sharing desks, the government has a really strong position on that in that document that I referred to that says desk sharing should not be encouraged because... Um, especially if there's equipment on that desk, a sneeze can put the virus everywhere. And remember the virus is not airborne other than on water particles that come out of your mouth when you breathe, sneeze, cough, talk. So actually having a lot of equipment, including keyboards, which are notoriously difficult to clean on someone's desk, and then someone else comes in for the next shift or to job share and sees all this equipment that's difficult to clean, they're not gonna be happy about that. And frankly, they're gonna be exposed to some germs there. So actually making sure that things, so that my, I suppose I have two tips for that. One, three tips actually. One, don't do it if you, can, if you don't have to, right? Um, but obviously that's a luxury thing to have. Um, secondly, um, push for a clean, your clean desk policy. Now I know most of the people on this call have probably been fighting for years to get clean desks and tidy offices. I know I certainly do in our office. Um, this is your chance to say absolutely has to be clean desk. Put it into the health and safety assessment that you do. That way you'll get a nice clean desk policy um, that you can enforce. Um, of course, the less clutter, the less place there are for germs and the easier it is to clean a desk. Um, the second thing then around or third thing after that is make sure that you disinfect between um, users. So having, if, if you've got one person, if you've got a cleaner coming in every day, make sure they wipe down all the equipment on all of the desktops, regardless of whether there's desk sharing. But if there is desk sharing, you probably need to increase that frequency to after every shift or every user and provide sanitizing wipes so that the new person coming in, if they're skeptical about the quality of that, can do their own desanitization um, in their workplace. Again, not expensive, keeps everyone mentally happy that they're in a safe environment um, in your office. 
Great, that was pretty comprehensive. Thanks, Greg. Um, there's another question from Sharon, uh, again, talking about employer responsibility. So in terms of sending symptomatic staff home, is it the employer's responsibility that they get home safely, i.e. should they send them in a taxi? I mean, again, I suppose it comes down to duty of care and, and risk assessment, that kind of thing. Yeah, indeed. And, and th that's one of those sticky questions that it's really handy to have a policy on. So sitting down right at the start with the executive team and saying, well, what do we do? So when someone goes home, we can't just leave them necessarily to their own devices, or maybe that's the conclusion. Actually, how someone comes and goes from work, that is not within the remit of us keeping a safe office. And the decision might be that the chance of that leading to problems is quite low. Therefore, our solution is let them sort out their own return to home. On the other hand, um, it might also be a decision that actually we owe these people if they've got a high fever, not looking after themselves particularly well, let's get them into a, an Uber to send them home. Now, obviously, that exposes the Uber, Uber driver, <laughs> which just has a whole knock on uh, and secondary impact. But pop a mask on them, get them into a into a Uber might be the solution that you arrive at. So much easier to have that conversation around what the policy is going to be in advance of someone turning up with a high temperature. Um, we had a, a presentation last week from a, um, a taxi firm actually called iGo. Um, they're a sort of umbrella taxi organization. They're developing an app specifically for our members so that uh, this is just a little, <laughs> just a little point of information, um, which should be available soon. Um, so that, uh, and they have uh, standards of cleanliness within the taxis that work for them. So that if, you know, in that situation we're just talking about, we could in fact, or in theory, one of our members could call up a cab on this I Go Anywhere app and, um, and call a, a sanitized taxi with all the um, sort of required, not PPE, but the required um, equipment in there. So just, just to let people know if that, if that was a, an issue with sending people home. Um, I think your point, Greg, about getting the um, executives on board was, was really, really important. I just have this vision of uh, some senior exec kind of leaning over his, his assistant's desk and talking to, you know, looking at the diary with her and things and all that, how to break those kind of habits and get the social distancing in um, and, and making that um, part of the, the, the office protocol, you know, don't lean over my desk anymore. It's a bit like when you're in Tesco and somebody leans in front of you to get the ice cream out, you know, you're going to get out of my space. But that, that needs to be formalized, I think, with the, um, with the executives. You, you've raised an interesting point there, which, which I'd like to touch on as well. So there's been a lot of uh, furniture companies trying to sell screens. These are sort of acrylic or glass screens that sit above a normal screen or instead of a normal screen, but go much higher. Um, as a sustainable organization, we actually don't like them because in six months time, there's going to be a lot of acrylic and glass going to landfill uh, because the pandemic's passed and no one wants them anymore. It also creates a bit of a sort of a, even if they're glass and see-through, a little bit of a sort of uh, isolating uh, impact. And the cubicle farm went the way of the dinosaur for very good reasons. Um, the other thing is the government doesn't like them either um, because, that, because the government thinks two meters is the, is the standard that should be observed. If you have to put a screen up, probably it's because you're cutting that two meters a bit short. Um, and, and the other thing is that we've discovered because we are in the furniture game, we know what's going on. The lead times for those is just blown out massively because the world's acrylic supplies have already been used in boots and various other places for front counter screens. So to have those in desks, it's five or six weeks lead time. And it's very expensive because, of course, there are people profiteering. So um, if that comes up as a potential solution, please think carefully about the environment. Remember, I come back to what the second C is climate change and the third C is cost. Is that an effective solution? And the government guidelines, they say, first of all, try and get rid of any work that requires less than two metres um, distancing. And, and if that involves desks, then have a good think about whether um, th some of those um, people can be spaced out a little bit more. So that's, that's the guidance on screens and the personal view about the sustainability of them. Um, don't fall for the sales pitch that says, oh, this will solve all your problems because it won't. Um, and the government's health advisors don't think so either. Great, well, that's, yeah, that's very interesting because uh, the screens are springing up all over the place, aren't they? Um, 
did we have another question? Well, Naomi made a point. Well, Naomi, yes, going back to your response to Naomi about the shared desks, she's, um, she said, so if every user has their own kit, mouse, keyboard, laptop, etc., and only shared the actual desk and monitor, that's probably the best approach. Right, right. As, as well, uh, as long as the desk has been wiped down and the monitor's been wiped down, which frankly, with a, with a wipe, you could quickly do yourself. Um, so yes, that, that's getting rid of all the nooks and crannies and the surfaces where, um, where uh, virus can, can breed. Uh, and we know that the sort of period that it stays alive is sort of three days. So that's too long to be sharing stuff. And, and I think, Naomi, that's a brilliant idea. Why don't you do that? Great. Um, and then Lindsay has said it, that the distance is being reduced to one meter today. Yeah, very interesting. And, and there are mixed views on this. I mean, there are people who are extroverts that are busting to get back into the pub, um, encouraged by the publicans, um, and therefore a one meter is very helpful um, for them. Uh, however, it, the point remains is, is the government mandating that everyone will only sneeze one meter in front of them? I can't see that happening, right? I mean, there, there are reasons why the two meters was established by the medical community. Um, the one meter, now, interestingly, the question, if you've noticed the government briefings, and sadly, I've watched far too many of them, um, there are rarely medical experts accompanying the politicians now because it's become political. And there's good reason for that, right? Because if people start to ignore the two meters, then the government's lost all control. However, if they decide that one metre uh, will keep people ob observing some sort of distance, that's probably better than nothing. So it's become a political question now. Um, and they don't invite the chief medical people um, along anymore because they are pretty much of the view that two metres is the right answer. And so you would have a very awkward situation um, in those briefing rooms. Uh, the, the, the question that you need to ask yourself is, is are we happy in our risk assessment with two metres being appropriate? And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, is, will staff come back to the office if it's only one meter because there is remember this is not just about the government's perception of risk or the medical community of perception of risk it's about staff perception of risk and if if someone's saying well look i've been on furlough for the last three months frankly i'm quite enjoying it i can get a little bit of work done if the furlough's turned off happy to work from home really don't want to come into the office and why should i well, then actually, you, we, we see, as, as what we've observed from, from both opening our own office again um, and our clients, is that actually getting people back into the office who are essentially must, must, are essential components of that office that must be there to get the job done, attracting them back into the office is surprisingly difficult. So there's a question that you need to ask to your, with your executive, which is, if we, do, if we go down to one meter, will st staff still be happy to come back into the office? Because remember, you're trying to create a safe bubble to entice them back to work. Um, and some of them might not be happy with it. Yeah, I think, I think that point about um, confidence and being comfortable is, is sort of key to it all, really, isn't it? Because we've seen, um, we know that this isn't going to go away for a long time. It's, I don't want to get too gloomy, but we've seen spikes uh, in countries that had more or less got rid of it and and it's inevitable I think that there will be further spikes in this country so I think um, I think employees have to be really really confident um, that the, the companies are doing absolutely everything they can before they before they should go back actually that is yeah it's Greg frozen no, I'm not frozen. Oh. I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. shall, shall I answer um, Addie's question? So Addie's got a good yeah. question here, which says, I have, she has to catch two trains to get to work, taking three hours on public transport. Wow. Poor thing. Addie, with heart, heart feels for you. That's pretty awful. But you must have been enjoying the last couple of weeks, uh, months. Her boss wants her to start making the journey into work in the next few weeks. Should she feel pressured to make the journey now too? Really good question. And there's a couple of different aspects to this. So first of all, if you are a vulnerable person and you would know that because uh, the NHS would have sent you a letter saying you should be shielding, then there is a set of rules that's different from the rest of us. Um, and those rules are um, if you are, if the, until the government lets you know that it's safe to go back to work, and there's talk about that happening in a couple of months time, um, before that period, you are able to stay at home on statutory sick pay and the government's happy to pay that. Um, However, if the op office is up operating um, and you're not on statutory sick pay because you're not shielding, then there is 
almost an obligation to go back to work because if you're and the way the employers see it is that the government pays the furlough if there is no work to do if there is work to do then um, as as restrictions are, li are lifted and people are allowed to return back to the office um, the government doesn't want to pay a furlough if that person has work to do and is able to get back to the office so it's a very tricky situation um, my, in that your employer could turn around and say, well, actually, you can't be on furlough. Um, if you're not shielding, you can't be on, on, on statutory sick pay, which, by the way, is only about £95 a week. Um, therefore, you're sort of obliged to go back to work. However, I think given what's happened, um, thinking about telecommuting and working from home at least a few, day, a few days a week seems like quite a reasonable response. And we've had, I, for instance, our team, we work very closely together um, physically, but we've actually worked together brilliantly um, using uh, Teams and, and Zoom and various other tools like that. So actually, is there something lost? Now, it might be a boss is particular about FaceTime, in which case you might have a bit more of a problem, but it would seem reasonable to say, hey, look, can we negotiate something there? Um, and of course, your number one defense is not only the fact that you've got a long commute, which actually you probably signed on for um, when you started that job, but more importantly, that you're going to be exposed on public transport. And what would happen if you, as an essential, a, essential part of the business happen to have to have happen to catch um, COVID-19 and therefore we're out of action for two weeks or something like that. So I think there's quite a, a two-sided conversation and worth a very well-reasoned discussion to say, can we come up with some sort of compromise um, that saves you at least a couple of trips um, a week? Okay, uh, we are continuing with two minutes. So there's a question here by Isabel. We're continuing, continuing with two metre distancing um, however, we recommend two meters being is important. That is stated as recommendation. Okay, thank you, great. Um, and then there's another question about, uh, a quick one earlier, about well, what's happening today? Um, and there's been a lot of sort of media heralding of the government relaxing to one meter today. Let's wait and see what that happens. I would be very surprised if the government didn't um, have a big caveat around that to say one meter is suitable for certain places, but also please think about your own circumstances and the risks involved. Um, but there could be a big announcement today that might relax things a bit. Okay, well, that's fantastic. We've, we've still got 52 people here, which is amazing because, you know, normally at this stage, people have kind of, have kind of got, had to go back to work. So obviously, as I said earlier, this is such an important, um, topic for everybody everybody feels it very very strongly and very personally as well as on on behalf of their company so thank you very much indeed Greg for that it was very fluent very comprehensive it was great um, I've got your slides and this has been recorded so um, anybody who who would like them well I'll send them to everybody um, and so then they have your contact details as well could I also just make a quick plea uh, after seconding Charmian's thank you to Greg. It's really cool. You were very quiet presentation, but extremely informative. We've done um, a survey and we're still conducting it of our PA club members about all these issues, return to work, company policies about having external events and going into travel situation again. We'd very much like it if anyone listening to this who has not answered our survey to complete it. We're going to do another e-shot reminding people about the survey today. There's a case of wine, not a bottle, a case of wine for one lucky entrant just to encourage you more to go in and complete the survey. And one final thing, if there's anyone attending today who's not a PA Club member, then please email me and we'll send you a link to that survey. So my name is Michael, spelt the normal way, dot hislop, H-I-S-L-O-P, at the PA club.com. And we look forward to having tons more survey entries in the next couple of days. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you. Greg, final word from you. Stay safe everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Bye. Bye.